appreciate that. Let's bow our heads for prayer. Heavenly Father, more than anything else, we'd rather have Jesus. We pray that's why we're here today, but if it isn't, we pray that somehow Jesus would speak to us through his spirit in such a way that we would commit ourselves to you. Use me, Lord, speak through these clay lips that you may be glorified and magnified in our lives. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You may have heard the story of Bill and John before. Bill and John lived in a retirement community. Uh, they, this retirement community had everything. It was amazing. Uh, it had been their dream, them and their spouses, to move to this retirement community. And, community. and every Tuesday and Thursday morning, Bill and John would play a game of checkers or chess together. Now, the interesting thing about the game of checkers or chess that they would play was because Bill was kind of starting to lose his memory, John would often have to prompt him. But John noticed that Bill was doing a little better. And so one day, John asked Bill, he said, Bill, he says, it seems like you're doing a little better with your memory. You're you're doing uh, these moves without as much prompting. And and, and, Bill. Bill said, yeah, that's, that's true. That's, what I, that's what's happening. John said, well, why is that? What's, what's going on? How come you can do that better now? And, and Bill said, well, uh, my wife and I have been going to a memory gym. And, uh, uh, you know, John said, well, what do you mean, a memory gym? And Bill said, well, this memory gym, they help you to go through brain exercises to improve your memory. And, and there really are these things. I've had members who've gone to these. And so... Um, and so uh, Bill shared with John all about this, and, and John said, well, that's really interesting. He said, uh, he said, do you think it's helping you? And Bill said, oh, absolutely it's helping me. And, uh, and John said, well, what's the name of this memory gym? And uh, Bill thought for a moment. He said, well, he said, let me put it this way. He says, you know that uh, flower that's uh, red and it's velvety and it's long stem and it's got thorns on it? And uh, John said, yeah. He says, he says, you mean a rose? And Bill said, yeah, a rose. And he turned around to his wife across the yard. He said, Rose, what's the name of that gym we've been going to? <laughs> well, you know, this weekend is known as Memorial Day weekend. And uh, with Monday being the actual holiday. And for many, it's little more than a three-day weekend that kind of marks the transition from winter and spring moving towards summer. And we've already had some beautiful summer-type weather, haven't we? It's been amazing. Uh, I got a little bit of sun the other day, sitting out several times during lunch at the office in the sun. And, uh, and as I was driving home yesterday evening from the office, uh, there was a lot of traffic on the highway heading south on I-5. And, and there was a lot of uh, people's cars that were loaded up with supplies for a weekend getaway. And there were RVs and there were trucks pulling trailers loaded with motorized toys like motorcycles and ATVs. I felt like rolling down my window and say, can I follow you? Because <laughs> uh, I grew up on those things and, and it looked like a lot of fun. But the true original intent of the weekend was to be a time of remembrance a memorial. In every city and town and community, there are memorials. We see memorials in the form of crosses along the highway signifying where a loved one was killed in a tragic automobile accident. We see memorial monuments are set up in nearly every city to commemorate war heroes or great citizens of that town. Buildings, bridges, highways, colleges, universities, hospitals, airports are named after people to help us remember them. Every memorial has a message. A memorial is a commemoration to recollect, to rehearse, to remember. World War uh, II produced many heroes. One such man was Lieutenant Commander Butch. He was a fighter pilot assigned to the aircraft carrier Lexington in the South Pacific. And one day his entire squadron was sent on a mission and he was airborne and on the way to that mission when he looked at his fuel gauge because he had just assumed that the crews on the deck of the ship had done their job and he realized that they had forgotten to top off his fuel tank. 
Now, he realized that he would not have enough fuel to complete the mission and get back to the aircraft carrier. His flight leader told him to return to the carrier, and so reluctantly, he dropped out of the formation, and he headed back over to the carrier. But as he was on his way back to the fleet, he saw something that turned his blood cold, as it were. A squadron of Japanese aircraft were speeding their way toward the American fleet. And the fleet was defenseless because their planes had already launched and were on their way to another sortie. And so he couldn't reach his squadron and bring them back in time to save the fleet, nor could he warn the fleet of the approaching danger because there wasn't time. There was only one thing that Lieutenant Commander Butch could do. He must somehow divert the fleet, divert the, the, the enemy planes from the fleet. And so laying aside all thoughts of personal safety, he dove into the formation of those planes. And, th- and he began to, to shoot his wing-mounted 50 caliber guns as he blazed in and charged in toward them. And he just went back and forth. And before they knew what had happened, they, they began to come to pieces, and one by one, these planes crashed. Now, as they crashed, the others began to get a little bit chaotic and wonder, what are we going to do? And, and real, realizing that his plane was now out of ammunition, Butch decided, this is what I'll do. Now, most of us might think, this is the time to turn around and say, I did as much as I could do, but not for Lieutenant Commander Butch. What he did was he continued to dive at those planes and weave in and out of them, clipping their wings, clipping their tail fins so that these planes would crash and those, uh, those airmen would have to use their red backpack. You were paying attention to the children's story, weren't you? And finally exasperated, the Japanese squadron took off in another direction. And deeply relieved, Lieutenant Commander Butch and his tattered fighter limped back to the carrier. Now, of course, the fleet hadn't seen what had happened. This was just far enough. It was out of their sight. Uh, But as he told his story, they reviewed the film from the gun camera that was mounted on his plane's tail. And it showed the extent of Lieutenant Commander Butch's daring attempt to protect his fleet. He had, in fact, destroyed five enemy aircraft all by himself. This took place on February 20, 1942. And for that action, Butch became the Navy's first ace World War II pilot and the first naval aviator to win the Congressional Medal of Honor. A year later, though, Butch was killed in aerial combat at the age of 29. His hometown would not allow the memory of this World War II hero to fade, and it's likely that if you've traveled much in the United States by air, you have been to the airport his city named after him, the busiest airport in the United States, Chicago's Butch O'Hare Airport, named in memory as a tribute to the courage of this brave young man. A long time ago, a woman named uh, Moina Michaels wrote this short poem, poem, We cherish the poppy red that grows on fields where valor led that seems to signal to the skies that blood of heroes never dies. We have freedom today because of men and women who have fought and died to secure freedom. And so Memorial Day is a day... Uh, to remember, a day of remembrance for those who have died in our nation's service. It traces its roots back to 1868 when General John Logan of the Grand Army of the Republic declared May 30th as a day of remembrance. Flowers were placed on graves of Union and Confederate soldiers at Arlington National Cemetery and uh, the day was originally called Decoration Day because they would decorate the tombs and gravesides. In December of 2000, Congress passed a resolution which asked all Americans to voluntarily and informally 
observe a moment of remembrance and respect at 3 p.m. local time. All the heroic acts on battlefields throughout history have made our country what it is today. We enjoy freedom and wealth that are unparalleled. We enjoy our freedom and our luxuries, and, have, and yet we, we must remember they have come at a great price. We enjoy freedom in America because men and women have died for our country. The cost of freedom is shed blood. We must never forget that. And while we celebrate Memorial Day once a year to remember those who fought to establish a free nation, and those who died to secure that freedom, every week on Sabbath morning and throughout the Sabbath hours, we celebrate the memorial of Christ and a reflection of what he has done for us. Amen? We celebrate a God who could speak the universe and our world into existence in every detail that had been imagined in his mind and forethought became, uh, became a creation of physical reality. We come and we celebrate a God who with his own very divine hands knelt into the muddy, miry clay and formed a human being and then breathed his own very breath making it a living being. We can't walk into a church service without remembering that those human beings having fallen needed somebody to regain their freedom for them. We can't walk into a Sabbath service without remembering that in the beginning Jesus was the Word of God and yet that word became flesh to come and dwell among us to save his people. God created us to be free. But he didn't just create us to be free. He came to redeem us so that we could be free again. Amen? It seems like it's so easy for us just to come here on Sabbath and come Sabbath after Sabbath to church, wherever we may happen to go to church, and slip into a routine of mere attendance. Perhaps that's what happened when one church had a bulletin board that had been decorated with pictures of its town's soldiers and the soldiers from the church who in years past had given their lives in service. Uh, the board was trimmed with red and white and blue and had little flags on it. And the little boy was looking up at the board after church one Sabbath when the pastor came up and he asked the boy how he liked the board. And the little boy said, well, he said, uh, he said tell me about it. And so the pastor explained that the pictures were uh, the men from their town and from their church who had died in the service. And the little boy thought for a moment and then he looked at the pastor and he said, was that the morning service or the evening service? And perhaps we're not a lot unlike that little boy sometimes when it comes to how we come to Sabbath. We laugh at this, but friends, let's not allow our Sabbath services to become mundane so that we forget the one who died to set us free from tyranny. Amen? That we might have liberty in his name. For this we are eternally thankful. We worship him, we praise him. In Galatians 3.13, Paul proclaimed, Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law, having become a curse for us. Christ became what we were so that we could be freed. It was Jesus who fought against Satan and his evil forces for our freedom. It was Calvary and the resurrection that secured our freedom from the bondage of sin. Paul is proclaiming that man does not have to live in bondage to sin. We don't have to. Because Jesus paid the ultimate price for freedom, just like Butch O'Hare. He gave his own life so that you and I could be set free from the bondage and the slavery of sin. He has wiped out our past debts. And he's now given us full citizenship to heaven with all the privileges that go with that citizenship. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 20, Paul says, For you were bought at a price. Bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. In other words, all of us belongs to God. We are, I am 
God's. It's time that we start confessing our freedom, brothers and sisters, instead of accepting our bondage. Did you get that? I think sometimes we just accept our bondage instead of confess our freedom. But Christ's death and resurrection has secured for us our freedom. Amen? It's secured our freedom. We don't have to be in bondage. Believe in your freedom, as Paul says in Galatians 5.1. He says, stand fast, therefore, in the liberty by which Christ has made us free. And do not be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. You are free. I am free. We are free. Repeat with me. I am free. We're free. Now, a person who's free and who has been in bondage tends to be pretty excited about it. If you were to say to somebody who had been captive and held captive for a period of time and it had been a torment to their life and finally they were freed and you said, how do you feel about that freedom? And they said, well, you know, it's kind of nice. I mean, you'd think, what in the world? There are many symbols that represent our freedom as Americans. Things like the flag, the Constitution, the Declaration of Independence, the Liberty Bell, the Statue of Liberty. But of all symbols, only one represents what freedom is all about. That symbol is the cross of Jesus Christ. No other symbol captures the true meaning of freedom like the cross does. No other symbol. Because it was there that Jesus paid the ultimate price for you and for me to be free. Amen? Now, I don't know who wrote this poem, but I like its message. In New York Harbor stands a lady with a torch raised to the sky. And all who see her know she stands for liberty for you and I. I'm so proud to be called an American, to be named with the brave and the free. I will honor our flag and our trust in God and the Statue of Liberty. On lonely Golgotha stood a cross, with our Lord raised to the sky, and all who kneel there live forever, as all the saved can testify. I'm so glad to be called a Christian, to be named with the ransomed and whole, as the statue liberates the citizen So the cross liberates the soul. When we realize this liberating truth, then our natural response is a desire to give our lives in faithful service to the one who so graciously and sacrificially gave his life for us. And this is another thing that we can remember today. Not only what those who have died for our country have done to help gain that freedom. And and not just only what Jesus has done for our spiritual freedom, and and I, I shouldn't even say only, but also what other believers before us have done because of that freedom. Like a Memorial Day plaque of granite, there is a wall of remembrance in Hebrews chapter 11 which honors those who set a great example of faith response to God. The first person in the Bible to die, who was the first person in the Bible to die? Kids, who was the first person in the Bible to die? Abel. I heard some very deep kids' voices. I think that's true. (laughs) You know, Hebrews 11.4 says that though he is dead, he still speaks. And I think that's true. Though he is dead, he still speaks. Um... And I think that's true of the person of faith because death is not the end in the sense that they still speak through the influence of their life and their death. Their life that they lived and their death that they died still live on in the influence that it has in future generations. Now those whose names were recorded in Hebrews 11 knew that God rewards faith. And they knew that God is pleased when we demonstrate that faith in action. And so they also understood that at the end result of faith is that we can attempt great things for God. Notice for a moment God's granite memorial wall. In verse 7 of of Hebrews 11, Noah built an ark and it says for us today, though it's hard 
work, and it may take a lifetime. It took Noah 600 years. Keep working. The ark is the symbol of the church, amen? Sometimes we may feel like it's taking a long time to see things happening, like things aren't taking place in the church that we'd like to see take place, and we have expectations that aren't being fulfilled. But like Noah, we need to keep working. Verse 8 is another person, Abraham. And Abraham went out not knowing where he was going. Abraham speaks to us today saying, when God calls, go. And he also says, when tests come, trust. Remember uh, the story of Isaac and God asking him to offer him in verse 17? And so from Abraham we learn that we have to stay the course and we need to trust God even when things look grim. In verse 29, Moses led the children of Israel through the Red Sea, and Moses speaks to us today saying, against overwhelming odds, keep moving forward. Are you hearing a theme here? Are you hearing a theme? No matter what it is that's confronting you, no matter what it is that seems to be an obstacle in your path to fulfilling God's purpose in your life or in the church, keep moving. Moving forward, verse 30, Joshua marched the army of Israel around Jericho. How many times? Seven times. Not seven times 70, that's a different text, different story. Seven times. Joshua speaks to you and me today saying, fulfill God's purpose even when it doesn't make sense. You know, it's easy for us to sit off on a course when it all makes sense, isn't it? When all the chips fall into place, when, when we have the plan and the plan makes sense to us, but when God says, go, go, and we don't know all of the details, and it doesn't make sense, go around that city seven times and blow horns. Really? Seriously? I mean, I'm afraid they're going to get up on the walls and start shooting arrows at us, and we're going to be, I mean, we're going to die. Just do it, Joshua. And so he does it, and God gives them great victory. Verse 31, Rahab hid and protected the spies. Rahab speaks to us today and says, even though it involves great risk, be on God's side. Be on God's side, no matter the cost. In verses 32 through 38 of Hebrews 11, we hear other heroes speak to us today saying, every victory in life, every accomplishment is given to us by grace through faith. And when life goes bad, don't give up. There's a better life coming. They didn't receive the promise, many of these saints who are on God's granite wall. They didn't receive the promises that God had given them in many instances, but they saw it from afar, and they lived it out, and they pursued the promise. And when necessary, they even died for it. And each of these heroes inscribed on God's memorial understood Paul's exhortation in Philippians 1, verses 27 to 30, where Paul writes this. He says, whatever happens, whatever happens. Can you say that with me? Whatever happens. Say that again. Whatever happens. That's important for us. Because sometimes, you know, our desire to follow God is conditional, isn't it? I mean, that's just our human nature. It's conditioned on on how this is going to turn out for me. Is this going to benefit me? You know, what are the advantages to me or to my family? But Paul starts out and he says, Whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then, I will know that you stand firm in one spirit, contending as one man for the faith of the gospel. Whatever happens. One of my all-time favorite movies is Saving Private Ryan. Anybody remember that movie? I, I ordered that on eBay a couple of years ago. It's been years since I had seen it. And, uh, and I watched it again and really enjoyed that movie because of the storyline. Uh, the movie is set in France during World War II. The Defense Department receives notice that a family currently has four sons serving in the war, and three of those brothers have been killed in the war. Horrible. 
And the fourth son is somewhere in France and they don't know where he is exactly. And the army decides that no matter, uh, that no matter what happens, no mother should ever have to suffer the tragedy of losing all four sons to war. And so the army sends a team after this last son, Private Ryan. The movie chronicles how in their search for Private Ryan, this unit of soldiers must overcome countless obstacles, not the least of which is the enemy, who continues to attack them at every turn, it seems. Along the way, as members of their team are wounded, and some are even killed, they begin to ask this question. Why is the life of this one private more important than the lives being sacrificed to bring him home? I think every soldier must at some point ask that question. Why is his life more important than mine? Tom Hanks plays the leader of that unit and in search of Ryan, and, and he does his best to maintain the focus of his men. He's a school teacher by trade at home, but now he's this unit leader, and he tells them that whether they fully comprehend it or not, this is their mission, and they are to carry it out. Their duty is to their country, and their country has asked them to save Private Ryan. And finally, they locate Private Ryan. They tell him that they have orders to get him home. They inform him about his three brothers who have perished in the war preceding him. But Private Ryan doesn't want to leave his unit. Ryan has orders. They must keep a group of German tanks from crossing a bridge until adequate air support is able to come in. And if they can't hold off the tanks, then they are to blow up the bridge because it's a main support route that provides provides support and, 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 and materials and whatnot, uh, arm, arms and whatnot to the, the German army. And, and if they can do this, it will impact the war. Private Ryan's honor and sense of duty to his unit wouldn't allow him to walk away from a battle that could cost his army buddies their lives. He didn't feel justified in himself flying off to freedom and safety and leaving his comrades to fight. So Private Ryan convinces Hank's character and his outfit to stay and to fight with them. He promises that he will leave with them after the battle. And so Hanks agrees. But only if Ryan will stay out of harm's way so that he can make it back home safely to his mother. A bloody battle ensues. Many lives are lost. And the remainder of Hank's entire outfit is killed in this battle. But as the battle comes to its conclusion, their mission is fulfilled as Private Ryan, Ryan has been saved. And at the conclusion of it all, there's a touching scene. Tom Hank's character is dying, leaning against uh, the wall or some debris on the bridge. Private Ryan comes to help, but Hanks tells him to go on. And then, pulling Ryan close, he says with all the voice he can muster, Earn this. Earn this. In other words, go home and live in such a way as to commemorate and to honor the lives that have been sacrificed to save you. Paul is writing to the Philippian Christians and to you and me today. And he tells them and he tells you and me the same thing that every person who has sacrificially give their given their lives for others before already knew. He tells the Christians of Philippi and you and me the same thing that Jesus well understood when he willingly went to the cross. Earn this. Live a life worthy of the gospel of Jesus Christ, not to gain salvation or right standing with God, but because He has so graciously and abundantly saved you at such great cost. Live a life worthy. And that's what Jesus calls you and me to do today. Live a life worthy of Jesus Christ. How? By remembering that those who have come before 
including Christ, committed themselves entirely to God and his mission. And so along with Paul and so many other faithful, will you and I dare to declare, I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. I have heard how Christians long ago were brought before a tyrant's throne. They were told that he would spare their lives if they would renounce the name of Christ. But one by one they chose to die the Son of God they would not deny like a great angelic choir sings I can almost hear their voices ring I pledge allegiance to the Lamb with all my strength with all I am I will seek to honor His commands I pledge allegiance to the Lamb Now the years have come and the years have gone and the cause of Jesus still goes on now our time has come to count the cost to reject this world and embrace the cross and one by one let us live our lives for the one who died to give us life till the trumpet sounds on that final day let us proudly stand and boldly say I pledge allegiance to the Lamb with all my strength with all I am, I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb, to the Lamb of God who bore my pain, who took my place, who wore my shame. I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb with all my strength. With all I am, I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. 
With all my strength, with all that I am, I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Sing it. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. With all my strength, with all I am, I will seek to honor His commands. I pledge allegiance to the Lamb. Let's bow our heads. Father God, more than anything else in this world, when we recall and memorialize those who've gone before and given their lives for freedom, and all the more our dear Savior Jesus, who died on Calvary's cross and now has left an empty tomb and prepares to meet us soon. Oh, Lord, may we, like those before, pledge allegiance, not just to country, but most of all, to the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. Help us to live like those who know what you've done for us.